rather than repeating everything in the last three or four minutes that did not get recorded, we'll just go ahead uh, and continue. If you've got two waves that meet, and they meet peak to peak, trough to trough, or in the case of sound waves, the rarefactions, the are, or the rarefactions where they're stretched apart, coincide with the other one with in both waves, or the compressions coincide, you're going to get a greater amplitude, you're going to get it louder. Um, if they are out of phase, like so, the peak here adds with the trough there, and they tend to mute each other, so amplitude will be less, maybe even zero, likewise here. Um, and that just depends on where they are in their phase. Now, these two waves are exactly the same because I copied one and pasted. What do we call it if we've got two waves that are the same and don't change from each other? No. They're in phase, but that just shows that, okay, we've got a peak here and a trough here. We could do that with opposite ones or different ones too. Coherent is the, is the term that if you've got the same waves that are going to keep going, lasers are coherent so that the way the light leaving them stays in the same phase the whole time because generally speaking a, a laser is a really good example of a standing wave. There's a small crystal or something in, in the middle, maybe a gas chamber, um, where the light is produced and then there are mirrors on both sides that allow the light to go back and forth and this is a stimulated emission which means that as a photon goes through it can strike an atom in there and cause two more photons of the same color and the same phase to be emitted and then they reflect and hit another one so you're energizing the stuff inside this laser causing it to be able to produce light and then the photons that hit those atoms create cause it to actually spontaneously make the light that are in phase. So you get a standing wave in the laser cavity. The two mirrors are maybe 99.5% mirrors. So almost everything gets bounced back and forth, but as that gets brighter and brighter, enough leaks out to get a very visible beam, and that beam is going to keep going the same in phase because the waves are coherent. Um, sound waves, it's harder to do that. Like we discussed yesterday, these boxes help refocus a lot of the um, sound going straight out so that it's almost like uh, a laser but it does uh, start to diverge right away as it leaves whereas a laser is the the nature of it is that it focuses it a lot more um, so a very powerful laser you can shoot and reflect off the moon if it's coherent enough so is that kind of like how, how the LRAD systems work there's like they kind of point it right yep. there, so only that person here, whereas everybody else is like what? Right, and so we can do that better. Um, you'll notice in some buildings too, uh, where there is a spot right in the center of, of a domed area where your voice, if you're talking, is really, really loud, but you can't hear people outside, or, um, or if you're outside and try and talk to someone outside the center and you try and talk to someone on the other side of the center, you can't really hear each other. Uh, that's because the acoustics of that area tend to focus the sound. So that is pretty similar in that case. Or um, you look at the side of a sideline of football games or soccer games or whatever, and they've got the microphones in the dish. Those dishes tend to reflect sound back into a point. So to some degree, you can do that with sort of lenses for sound. Uh, Blue Yep. So they have and you don't hear anything. Yeah, cool. Good application of it. Um, this, is, these two boxes, these are called beat boxes. Not joking. It's a different use of the term for sure. Um, but the reason is because of the because these can be tuning forks can be slightly out of tune when we strike them we can get them to interfere with each other, but they're slightly different frequencies. So instead of having the same wave over and over, it's a little bit shorter. So now you'll have points where these add constructively, but if we were to follow these waves out, at some points they would add 
destructively so that you actually get changes of either greater loudness or less loudness. And so let's see if adding it like this, it's, it's audible. I'm not sure that was enough. I could hear, I, yeah, I could hear the very quick um, change. Yeah, if I silence one, then we don't hear that anymore. Can, can you guys hear all that? Whoa, 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 whoa. It's kind of like an echo, but it's a whoa, 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 whoa. That's this effect, the fact that there's slightly different waves leaving, and so they aren't always uh, constructively interfering. Sometimes they destructively interfere, not enough to completely silence it but you get the changes in the, um, in the loudness, in the intensity. I don't know if I, now if these are perfectly in tune with each other and they vibrate the same, we shouldn't hear that at all. Let's see if that's true. Oh, very slow. The closer these are to their own, to each other's frequencies, the slower that beat is. The beat is the periodic rising and falling. But since they're apparently just slightly out of tune with each other, just slightly, that frequency is quite slow with nothing here, and then we can adjust it a bit with the differing levels of this that, that alter the frequency. Quite a bit different in frequency, maybe still only a one or two hertz, but enough to make that quite quick. Um, if you're interested, there is a whole section of that on that in your book. I opted not to go into detail with that, but Morgan, there's math in there. Oh, yay! Okay, let's talk. If we have, uh, well, we've already talked about most of the stuff on this last reading. Um, compare and contrast transverse and longitudinal standing waves. They're both going to be made up of a similar shape where you'll have a certain number of waves. Um, but especially uh, J there, the shape of standing waves on a guitar string to standing waves in a flute, which is open at both ends, or a clarinet, which is only open at one, you get different um, places for the nodes and I think better than the book has pictures that describe that a lot better than I can and from what I saw from readings you guys were doing fine with that um, so consult the book on that portion what I want to talk about now is the Doppler effect which has some neat effects but also some useful things could we get the one light in back turned off, please. Uh, these photos are out of the book too because it's it's got very nice illustrations, but I want to talk through them a little bit so that we can see um, what's going on and have time for questions. So imagine that you are standing, this is not to scale by the way, I think, because that truck would be a lot bigger, but imagine you are standing near a fire truck with the siren going you would hear it going up and down and, and just normal. Let's picture for the sake of our argument though, a single, that truck emitting a single frequency. It's just easier to picture for now. Um, so a single frequency, this is sort of tracking the condensation, so the squished part of the wave. It's emitting them and they're going out in all directions so that a person standing behind the truck or a person standing in front of the truck is going to, their ears are going to hear the same number of condensations in that wave per second. And maybe it's, it's pretty high pitch, so maybe it's 1,500 hertz. 1,500 times per second, you get one of these condensations hitting your ear. Um, this is just representing that they're going out equally. You might have things blocking it that would decrease the amplitude, so the loudness would be less but the frequency should be the same. But now, imagine that this 
fire truck accelerates in order to crush the woman on the right. Um, and the truck is going quite fast. Well, as it go is moving that way, it's still emitting the siren sound, um, some perhaps some sort of perverse warning, like I'm going to crush you. <laughs> um, but what you're going to see is the woman here now, every time this emits one of those condensations, before it emits another one, it moves a little closer, perhaps a lot closer depending on its speed. And likewise, and so she is actually going to hear one, and then the next time the next one's emitted, the truck's a little closer. Back here, the opposite happens. He's perfectly safe. He's watching it all. <laughs> and um, so it, he hears one condensation. The truck moves away, he emits another one. So it's actually stretching the amount of time that it takes for him to get consecutive <coughs> condensations because the truck is a little bit farther away. And likewise, the woman here, the truck is a little bit closer. So what happens is shown here. Oh, that, that truck is going quite fast. It's even <laughs> blurring. Um, but what she hears is one, first condensation, second one that was emitted a little bit later, but with the truck sooner, third one with the truck closing in, and it's practically on top of her. All that, ha all that um, squishes those condensations. So her ear is actually picking up more condensations per second than it would have normally. The guy in back watching, he's even got his hands in his pockets. <laughs> <laughs> yep, well, that's what you get. Um, he has heard the first one has gone past him. Second one is still coming in because the truck moved that far. And um, he's probably not going to hear her, the thud or squish for quite a while. But the truck is moving away, so that's stretching these out. Both of these things are affecting what the listener would hear because the woman here is actually hearing far more of these condensations per second than she would have normally, or at least some more than she would have with the truck being stationary. More condensations per second mean a higher frequency. So that means a higher pitch, higher pitch, pitch sound. The man in the back hears fewer per second than he would normally. So that means lower frequency of the sound and lower pitch. So this is the reason why if you watch an auto race, especially um, a few years ago, my wife and I joined my, some of my in-laws and went to the Indy 500. And we were sitting around the fourth corner, fourth turn, which by the way is the best turn because that's where all the accidents happen. Um, but as the, assuming there wasn't an accident, the cars would come by and they'd come at a high pitch, and then they say pass, they go down. And, and it's a very, very audible difference. What's that? The sound of speed is new. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then often that was a rainy day too, so the track was a little wet. They, they'd come out and they, okay, it rained for 15 minutes. They'd come out and they'd dry it and they'd have these big jets like we're blowing flame on it, the track to dry it, and then the cars would go around for a while in uh, under caution, and they get four or five laps in out of caution. They were so intent on jockeying for position that um, there were a couple. There was one really bad accident where the car turned sideways and went sideways into the divider between the track and pit lane or pit row, and it just. Boom! Pieces <laughs> flew off, and the, um, and and that brought the race to a not a halt, but pretty slow. Well, they they brought out the tow truck. Can you you've seen tow trucks? No, the tow truck just picks up the car, the whole car. It is this is useless because nothing will roll on this anymore. And then and then like three guys come out with a new cover for the divider, which is like. <coughs> 15 feet of styrofoam that they put over the concrete barricade. And they're good. Good go. You know, maybe they brush, brush the uh, pieces up. The driver got out, got out of the car immediately. He was fine. Uh, which was amazing, too, because he must have been going 150 when he hit that thing sideways. It was really neat. Um, anyway, um, a little off task, off topic, but there is a, a bit of a mathematical derivation 
in the book describing the math of how this happens relative to the truck speed um, compared to either the observer be about to be crushed or the one watching indifferently in back. Well, you know, he's interested. He's leaning <laughs> forward a little bit. Um, it's sort of like at the, at the racetrack, but except I'd expect her to not just jump up and run away. Um, so that we have two cases here. We have one case where the uh, source here is moving toward a stationary observer. And we're going to be able to describe the frequency here. This is the frequency that the observer hears. It's going to be based on the frequency that the source is emitting. The thing that everyone would agree on if they're all stationary relative to each other. And then, right. We get something that is a little reminiscent of some of the uh, formulas that we saw last year with special relativity. The velocity of the source, uh, I'm sorry, of sound compared to the velocity of the source. So Vs here, the velocity of sound. V is, did I get, I got that backwards. Yes. I want to make sure Vs is going to be the velocity of the source. Yep. My apologies. Because that wouldn't have made sense of source. And V here is just the velocity of the sound in the air at that time. Uh, so this is actually really similar to special relativity, aside from we usually have a radical under there. So that's for when the um, you're going going to be crushed. The observer who is safe is going to hear something a little bit different, but very similar in form. I think it's just that it's a plus. Yes. So you get a different result but similar form whether you are safely watching this spectacle or the butt of the spectacle. Um, but in both cases, you can see how this is going to be modified. If the object or if the source is moving towards you, you're going to have 1 divided by 1 minus something. So this fraction is going to be greater than 1. 1 divided by something less than 1. And so your frequency goes up. If, you've got, if you're the observer where it's moving away, this fraction, this is going to be greater than 1 somewhat. And so 1 divided by something greater than 1. Sorry, yeah, is itself less than one. And you mean the fraction of the entire I meant the entire thing. It will be greater than one. This will be less than one. There we go. Um, and so your, the frequency of heard is going to be less than the one that you that is originally emitted, so you're going to get a lower sound. Okay. So that's what happens as, um, as you're observing this woman being crushed or being crushed yourself. But there's another option, because this is quite a spectacle. So some people will naturally want to run towards it to see it better. And some, of course, will be horrified and want to run away. Not me, I'd like to watch it. Um, so there are also cases, and it's actually a little bit different physics that occurs if you are approaching a stationary sound. And that's because as 
if you are going, if you've got a moving source here, you're actually getting a different frequency emitted, essentially. But if you are running towards or away, and this is the, there we are. This is a simpler case where we're running just towards a stationary sound. Um, the, the wavelength of the sound isn't actually changing like it is with our fire truck example. The wavelength stays the same, but if you're moving towards it, you are actually yourself intercepting more of those condensations as, than you would normally. So again, the, the sound increases in frequency, or if you're moving away from it, you would be intercepting fewer of these. So your sound would be a little, or your sound would be a little lower. Although that's similar, if you actually work out the math, which again, you may do in the comfort of your own home or elsewhere um, by using the book, what you're going to see are if you are moving towards a stationary sound, Again, it's going to be a higher frequency. What the what? Mine boosters made something out of, and I can listen. Are you making one? That sounds appealing. Um, you're going. It's going to start out again with the original sound, but now the form of this takes a little bit different, uh, a little bit different form that where VO here is the speed velocity of the observer. And V again, the plane V is the velocity of sound. So we see again though, if you're moving towards, this fraction is going to be non-zero. So one plus it is something a little more than one times the original uh, frequency gives you a little bit higher frequency than normal. Or if you're moving away from the stationary sound. you're just going to decrease it by a similar amount. So we kind of get a similar feel from both of them. Um, if we want to simplify this for our own sake, I'll, one, always remember if the sound and the observer are getting closer together, you're going to have a higher frequency. So that can help you remember which whether it's plus or minus here. Um, but we can actually simplify this a little bit so that if you've got a moving source, <coughs> we'll combine the, what we saw on the previous slide where your, the frequency that you observe is equal to the frequency of the source times one over one, and then we want it plus or minus doesn't really matter. Minus or plus um, velocity of the source over the velocity of sound, where the minus is if you are moving towards, gives you a higher frequency, and the plus is if you are moving away. And then likewise, we can get these together. This would be moving, sort, uh, moving observer. frequency that you observe is equal to fs times the source frequency. Now it's plus or minus the velocity ratio, where plus here is towards, minus is away. There are cases where both could be moving relative to a stationary point. Um, and so you can combine these. I would, there is a formula that combines them both in the book. I'll write that in a second. I 
personally would probably just say, okay, let's find the effect for the observer moving first, use that new frequency that I found as my source frequency, and then figure out what I, the observer would eventually get. However, if you really, really like the math that Morgan does, if you've got both or either moving, you can combine them by the finding the total frequency is going to be one over the other. And I gotta write this down, otherwise I'm going to goof it up. This is a nice one. This is this is impressive. The original frequency and I need all that room. One plus or minus the observer free velocity over the speed of sound. And then we've got the fraction from the bottom, one minus or plus the source velocity over the speed of sound. And then you have to remember, okay, which one's moving where. I would suggest doing the other one up above first, or do, it, do them separately. But this is actually an okay way to do it. The reason that it's written like this, plus over minus, or minus over plus, is that the plus and the minus both mean sort of the same thing, that you are getting closer together. So what you do is, say, you've got a truck, truck, and uh, here's the ladder, no, it's a tow truck, I guess. Um, it'll have its velocity, and this would be the velocity of the source. Got its siren going. Not that tow trucks have sirens, Some but do. do they? Some do. Okay, the obnoxious ones. Yeah. And then you've got your person over here. Running, perhaps also that way. What you do is you pick some point in the middle and say, okay, what's the velocity relative to that point? So the, the truck's getting closer, the person's getting farther away. That would help you then figure out which to use, plus and minus or minus and plus, depending on whether the truck's getting closer, the person's getting farther away. And they would adjust, you would adjust accordingly to that. So uh, that formula always works for as long as you as long as you use it right it's okay. just a combination of the two that we saw Ooh, pretty uh, sound formula then huh <laughs> you can't just use one velocity no because you're only getting part of the effect as it turns out it's a, it's sort of weird to think of that I agree um, but because the physics of what's happening is different in each case, the truck going towards something is actually changing the frequency. The person going towards their way is not. It's just intercepting more. You can't do it all in one step and just say, oh, their relative velocity is this. You kind of have to look at their individual velocities compared to either a stationary source and a moving person or a stationary observer and a moving source. Yeah. So is the Doppler effect where it causes sonic boom? No. No. Um, the sonic boom is actually the fact that as the as a jet is getting closer, it's actually pushing kind of a bubble of air in front of it, and it's when that air t tears. So it's sort of like thunder, because that's a very rapid movement of air as well. Um, and so it's, yeah, the speed of sound, and I don't know all the physics behind that, but the speed of sound is just the point where that air now tears apart. There is undoubtedly a good picture here, and actually um, what you see for that is the sonic boom is also sort of a, uh, a really, really big construct of interference of the sound that's building up, so it's, it is sort of related to this. If you've got a jet, this is going to be bad. It's, it's some sort of flying pencil. 
It's a flame jet, but it'll work. There's no little buzz, ball, bells and whistles on it, but it'll work. <laughs> Um, as it's going farther or faster and faster, the sound waves also are. That's that's the real thing. It's not even just the air. It's the sound. It's sort of pushing a bubble of sound in front of it, because it's emitting the sound, but it's keeping up with it. And so it's sort of as it tears through that and starts going faster than the sound it's emitting. That's when you get it. Get the the big um, constructive interference of all of those sound waves pushing up against each other. So it's sort of like it, it's storing a battery of sound that suddenly releases. And on the ground then you hear all of that all at once. That's not an, oh, I know that's not an overly satisfying uh, explanation. It's sort of what's happening, but I don't have a prepared explanation, better prepared explanation. Mm -hmm. Once you're going faster and you see sound, does everything still sound the same? Yeah, then it goes back to essentially sounding the same as my re is my recollection. It's the act of breaking the sound barrier that causes the most noise. Something for more research, I think. I'm not I'm not sure about that either. Something for more research. Um, 